Well, if you have your Bibles, please open up to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'd like to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Let's pray one more time and ask God to bless the ministry of his word. Gracious Heavenly Father. We are frail children of dust feeble as frail but you've been mindful of us you've been gracious and for many in this room you've you've breathed your spirit upon us and made us alive and saved us from our sins we we thank you and we pray that you would come now in a special way you've you've promised that where two or three are gathered in your name that you're in the midst we pray that you would keep your promise in a wonderful way Help preacher and hearer alike for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. William Cooper was an English poet who wrote many Christian hymns. We sang two of them this morning. 309, Jesus, where e'er thy people meet. And number 21, God moves in a mysterious way. He was a remarkably gifted man who loved the Lord Jesus Christ. But Cooper suffered from deep depression during his last 27 years of his life. He struggled wrestling intensely with suicidal despair. Mental illness tormented him. And yet in all those 27 years, William Cooper was not overcome by his despair. His faith in Jesus Christ did not fail him. One reason Cooper endured through this terrifying, troubling melancholy, as they called it in the 18th century, is God graciously provided a dependable and beloved friend for William Cooper, a friend who loved him sincerely and fervently in both good and bad times. John Newton, best known for writing probably the most famous hymn ever, Amazing Grace, was Cooper's faithful friend, sent by God to Cooper, to comfort the faint-hearted. John Newton also authored the hymn we sang this morning, number 79, Though Troubles Assail Us and Dangers Affright. Newton and Cooper lived in the same small town of Olney, England, where Newton pastored a small rural church. Did you know that? John Newton had had a very checkered past as well. Although he had a godly mother as a boy, he left England to become a slave trader in Africa. While enduring a horrific and nearly deadly storm at sea, God had dealings with Newton, putting him on a path to repentance, faith, and a thorough conversion to Jesus Christ. From a slave trader to a Christian pastor, to a world-renowned writer of some of the church's most beloved hymns of worship, which have been translated into dozens of languages and have been sung by God's people globally for nearly 250 years. Few people actually know that John Newton nursed, cared for, and deeply loved an obscure friend in a small town of Olney, England, who suffered severe mental illness for decades. I should say also, if you've seen the movie Amazing Grace, he also was very good friends with one of the men in Parliament that was instrumental in ending the slave trade. 
John Newton stood by his friend's side during Cooper's painful, puzzling, and horrific attacks from his depression. Their friendship is a tremendous example for us all of how brotherly love refreshes, supports, improves, assists, and encourages the heart and soul of a needy brother or sister in Christ. In part because, because of the faithful friendship Newton imparted to Cooper, the church has been blessed with some of the greatest Christian hymns and poems ever written for worship of our blessed Savior. This is not hyperbole. I'm going to say it again ever written for worship of our blessed Savior, Cooper and Newton. Our Trinity hymnal carries several of their hymns, five of William Cooper's hymns and 13 of John Newton's hymns. One of the things Cooper and Newton would do together as they were fond of visiting each other in their respective homes was to write poems, hymns, and to pray. Even after John Newton moved away from the small rural town of Olney to go to England to take up a much larger church and pastor there, he and Cooper became great letter writers, and often Newton would make trips back to the small town of Olney to check on his beloved brother. The Olney hymn book, written by Cooper and Newton, was first published in February of 1779. Their hymnal first used only in the small rural uh, church in Olney is now published and can still be purchased on Amazon. Over time, over time, their hymns have been sung by many, many children of God globally. In 1771, Cooper wrote, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. A few years later in 1774, Cooper wrote, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. What a wonderful thought to meditate on. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. How wonderful it is to witness the great good God brings through great suffering. In one of Newton's written letters in which the recipient's name was blotted out to honor their privacy. Newton's warm-hearted love and biblical wisdom comes out so clearly. Listen as I read a small portion of his letter to a suffering saint. Quote, I can sympathize with you in your trouble, yet knowing the nature of our calling, that by an unalterable appointment, the way to to the kingdom lies through many tribulations. I ought to rejoice rather than otherwise that to you it is given not only to believe, but also to suffer. If you escape these things, knowing all the Lord's children are partakers, might, might you not question your adoption into his family? How could the power of grace be, manif be manifest either to you, in you, or by you without afflictions? How could the corruptions and devastations of the heart be checked without a cross? How could you acquire a tenderness and skill in speaking to them that are weary without a taste of such trials as they also meet with? You could only be a hearsay witness to the truth, power, and sweetness of the precious promises unless you've been in such a situation as to need them and to find their suitableness and sufficiency. The Lord has given you a good desire to serve him in the gospel, and he is now training you for that service. Many things, yea, the most important things belonging to the gospel ministry are not to be learned by books and study but by painful experience. You must expect a variety of exercises, but two things he has promised you, speaking of our Lord to this recipient, two things he's promised you. One, that you will not be tried above 
what he, what he will enable you to bear. And two, that all things work together for your good. What wise counsel Newton gave to his friend through this letter. Christian, what clouds are you dreading? What trials are you fighting? What is causing you to be afraid? Remember, God is faithful. He's a covenant-keeping God, and he's a promise-keeper. God's words are bound by his own oath, by his very character. You and I can and must trust him. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Johnny Erickson Tata, a woman who knows much about severe long-term suffering, because as a teenager she dove into a shallow lake, becoming paralyzed as a lifelong quadriplegic. She says regarding this particular hymn by Cooper, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. She said, it amazes me that those lines were written by a man whose soul was tormented by years of dark depression. In May of 1800 at William Cooper's funeral, John Newton was selected to give the sermon. He opened his Bible and read from chapter three of Exodus. Quote, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And Moses looked and behold, the bush was burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. John Newton closed his Bible and said, my friend William Cooper was indeed a bush in flames for 27 years, yet he was not consumed. The friendship of John Newton and William Cooper was at times filled with hardship and painful experiences, and yet John Newton remained a faithful, loving, sincerely and fervently fervent friend for this man, William Cooper, who suffered incapacitating mental illness for 27 years. What a blessing for Cooper to have such a faithful friend. And what a blessing for us to be able to enjoy the fruits born out of their friendship. Again, it's amazing how God constantly brings good from sufferings. And the good he often is aiming to produce in us is that we practice brotherly love. Love for one another and that this love of the brethren would abound and be fervent and be from a pure heart. I'd like for us in the remainder of the time to approach this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25 under four headings. One, why we love the brethren from verses 22a and 23. Second, how we love the brethren found in verse 22b. Third, encouragement to loving the brethren, found in verses 24 and 25. And then finally, we'll finish with hindrances to loving the brethren. In our passage, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, Peter features just one command for believers. Love the brethren. He says, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. But... As always, with the New Testament, this is a command that is surrounded by multiple indicatives. In this passage, we have two indicatives for one command to love the brethren. When the New Testament uses an indicative statement, it's discussing what God has done, what God is doing, or what God will do. And on the other hand, an imperative statement or a command are used when saying what we should do. The specific relationship between these two, the indicative and the imperative, is very, very important because it reveals the way God wants us to grow up in holiness. We must first partake of what God has done, is doing, or will do in order to rightly respond to his commands, what we are to do in our process of growth in holiness. So let's take up our first heading, why we love the brethren found in verse 22a and 23. First look at verse 22a, 
where we find our first indicative, a perfect participle. Verse 22a reads, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit. Now I want to draw out some facts regarding the two words obeying and the word truth. The exhortation to love the brethren is grounded in the fact that you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the spirit. Now, what does that mean? Purified your soul in obeying the truth. Without getting too bogged down into the Greek grammar and vocabulary, I'd like to compare scripture with scripture to help us see what Peter means. You've purified your soul in obeying the truth through the spirit. First of all, we can rule out the idea that Peter is thinking that purification or holiness is the result of our own self-directed obedience. No, no, no. That would fly in the face of the entire New Testament. I believe the English word here, obedience, is meant to describe what we normally refer to as conversion. Peter is not only Peter is not the only New Testament writer to use obedience in a way to signify conversion. In many other places throughout the New Testament, obedience means submission to the gospel. In Romans 15, Paul had been explaining his strategy or method for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He wants Jesus Christ to get all the glory. And in verse 18, he writes to the Roman believers. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient. He didn't want to take any credit for another man's work. In this context where Paul is preaching the gospel, he understands that conversions of Gentiles or obedience of the Gentiles can only be through the truth of the gospel. Also, back in Romans 1, he uses the same language, obedience. In verse 5, he writes, Through him, that is Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that through grace in Jesus Christ, he received this ministry or this apostleship to bring about obedience to the faith. That is the conversion of people among all the nations. Not only does the word used for obeying persuade us to believe that 1 Peter 1.22a refers to conversion, but also the word for truth in the same verse. By the phrase, the truth, Peter's referring to the gospel. This is, this is very common approach throughout the New Testament as well. He could, we could now turn to dozens of proof texts for this assertion, but consider just two. Ephesians 1.13, the Apostle Paul explaining redemption in Jesus Christ writes, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then also in James chapter 1, verses 16 and 18, James is discussing loving God while under trials. And he writes, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his will, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So with all that grammar and vocabulary study, look back at verse 22a, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So what Peter is saying to us and to his readers is that the command to love the brethren in 22b is rooted and grounded in their conversion in in, in, described in 22a. In the original grammar, this phrase that contains the first of two indicatives since you've purified yourselves in obeying the truth. This is a perfect participle, which is signifying a past action that has ongoing consequences. And indeed, when you define conversion as faith and repentance in Christ, 
That's a past action that has ongoing consequences. We understand that when we are initially regenerated and then place our trust in Christ and repent and turn away from our sins, we have conversion, a past action. But in our progressive sanctification, we also have daily repentance and faith as we maintain and grow from our initial conversion. So one of the goals or purposes of your conversion is genuine love for fellow believers in Christ. It's not an option. It's one of the reasons why God saved you was to love the brethren. The second or the second reason or indicative in the passage given for why we love the brethren is verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Here we see the command to love is rooted in being born again. Now by born again, Peter refers to being granted new life. This new birth is worked in us by the word, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter writes, through the seed of the word of God, which is an incorruptible seed, the gospel promises. The covenant of grace is a word of God that lives and abides forever. John and Paul also teach as Peter teaches here. Consider with me one passage from John and one from Paul briefly. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, who was a religious leader and a ruler of the Jews of the sect of the Pharisees. So this man was very intelligent and had much knowledge about God and about the scriptures. I'm thinking Nicodemus is probably like many of you in this room. He, like you, had been raised in the church or in an assembly of believers. He, like you, heard great teaching all your life. He, like you, attended a well-prepared Sunday school week after week. But for him, it was Saturday. You have been under the teaching and family worship of parents who love and have been in concern for your eternal soul, as I'm sure Nicodemus was. So what Jesus has told Nicodemus, Jesus tells you here this morning, John 3, 6 through 8, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. Also, the apostle Paul writing the Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10 touches on this as well. But he applies, he's applying it to Gentile listeners. He says, and you, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For Peter's readers, God has used the gospel of Jesus Christ to beget them to new life. And on the basis of that life, they are to love one another fervently. So now let me summarize our first point. Why do we love the brethren? Well, according to 1 Peter 22a and 23, we love the brethren because God has first loved us by granting us the grace of faith and repentance, which we call conversion, and because we've been born again 
by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter says it this way. Since you have been purified, excuse me, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, by incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, why did I go through that pattern for that one small point to tell you that it's conversion and it's being born again is why you love the brethren? Because to ask you to love the brethren, if you're not converted and born again, would be a... a, a hopeless thing to do. You can't love the brethren unless you're born again, unless you've been converted. The command is dependent upon the indicative, what God has done and is doing. Well, let's go to our second point. How we love the brethren found in verse 22 B in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. The second point brings us to the very theme of the entire passage, which is this exhortation to love the brethren. In the Greek, the word is Philadelphia. Philia is affection or friendship, and Delphia is brothers. So the Greek word Philadelphia means love of the brethren or brotherly love. Peter shows us this love for fellow believers is to have three qualities. This love is to be sincere. We mean genuine love, which means the brotherly love has no insincerity in it. It's unhypocritical love. You know what a hypocrite is? Hypocrites are those whose outside does not match their inside. We might say that They have fake love. God wants us to love the brethren with a genuine, honest, sincere love. This is the love that is open and transparent. It's a love that is authentic. This is a love built on truth, not lies. This is the love that is, that is vulnerable, that take, takes risks. This is a love that takes time and effort and selflessness. I think of John Newton. What a good example of this brotherly love. This is a love of truth, a love and affection for fellow believers in Christ. Secondly, Peter says it's a fervent love. This is an earnest love, much like the love we observed in the friendship between Newton and Cooper. The original Greek word used here in 1 Peter for fervent is also used in Luke 22, 44, where Luke writes, and being in agony, he prayed earnestly. That's our word, earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's our word. He prayed earnestly, fervently. This describes a constant love, a passionate love. Now remember, God is describing for us the love he wants us to have for Christian brothers and sisters. This is different than the love we have for outsiders in the world. And this is different than the love we have for our enemies. This is a special family love. The family of God is to have a special love, one that will endure forever and ever, even into the new heavens and the new earth. A constant, never-ending love. Keep on loving. This means begin doing this and keep on doing it. This is an intense love lasting beyond your lifetime. And number three, Peter says, it's a love from a pure heart. This means a love from your whole heart, your inner being, your true affections, a single hearted love, not mixed, not half hearted. In John 13, 35, when Jesus was with his closest disciples at the final Passover meal, right after Jesus told Judas Iscariot, what you do, do quickly. He tells them this, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the measurement tool for you 
and others to know that you're a disciple of Jesus. Do you love the brethren? Sincerely, fervently, and from a pure heart. Now the love we're talking about is not a love that just stays in your mind and in your thoughts. No, no. The love we're talking about is a tangible love in reality. It's not just theory. This means this love regulates your counsel and your words to the brethren. This means this love regulates your activities, your hands and your feet and your time and your behaviors. And this means this love regulates how you spend your money. Your words, your actions, your money, not just your feelings and thoughts. This is revealing, isn't it? It's exposing and convicting, isn't it? So I ask myself and I ask you, to what extent do your words, actions, and money serve and promote genuine love for fellow Christians? Do some self-examination this morning. Can it be said of you that you are one whose words and counsel, whose behavior and activities, and whose money is utilized in part for the love of the brethren? If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul also teaches what Peter teaches, that we're to love the brethren. Paul does it in a little different way here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Let me read it and make a few comments. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 14. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in the love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. So not only do we love sincerely, fervently, and with a pure heart, according to Paul here, we also love by warning those who are unruly. I've had to do that. And I can say, bless God, that when I've done that, the unruly has repented and changed their ways. Comfort the faint-hearted. In this local church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, we have people that are faint-hearted. Matter of fact, all of us at one time or another will probably become faint-hearted if we're not right now. What do we do with a fellow believer who's faint-hearted? Get a grip. No. What do we do? Comfort. That's how we love. And what about the weak? What about the one who just keeps falling down? Same sin week after week. They, they just, they, 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 they're sorry for their sin. They repent. They're trying to do better, but they're just weak. What do we do with them? Write them off. What does Paul say? Uphold the weak. Uphold the weak and be patient with all. And then he says something pretty, pretty in your face. See that no one renders evil for evil. That's a natural thing, isn't it? You do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. But he says, see that no one renders evil for evil. Not in my church. We're to love the brethren. It's hard to love the brethren sometimes, isn't it? You know, because we've been born again and converted and we've joined this church, we're with people that we probably never would have been with by our own choice. 
We're diverse. We're different. And a lot of you would not have chosen me to be your friend. And I wouldn't have chosen you to be my friend because you don't have the things in common that I have. But we're, we're both part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we're part of the body. And now we're stuck with each other. <laughs> and the Lord says what? To love one another sincerely, fervently, with a pure heart. To uphold, to comfort, even to admonish one another. So now we move to our third heading, encouragement to loving the brethren. Verses 24 and 25. And I'm going to start by reading 23. It says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Notice Peter in verse 23 tells us that the word of God lives and abides forever. And then in verse 25, he says, the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word, the gospel that was preached to you. Peter quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses six through eight, to bring encouragement to suffering believers throughout Asia Minor. And these words encourage and comfort us today, don't they? Tom Schreiner remarks wonderfully on this portion. He says, he says, perhaps Peter uses the word living because the word produces life. And he uses the word enduring because the life once activated will never cease. This is encouragement for us to know and to sense our frailty and weakness. We have parents, grandparents, even our dear spouses and even our dear children that have died. They're no longer among the living. We miss them and we feel grief and pain. But oh, what joy to read and to learn that even though all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Praise God for your conversion. Praise God for your being born again. And honor God by loving the brethren sincerely, fervently, and with a pure heart. And fourth and finally, we conclude by considering some hindrances to loving the brethren. And I just, I just kind of, I didn't take these from the text. I thought, you know, what are some hindrances for me? And what might be some hindrances for you? The first hindrance to loving the brethren is you and I, for everyone in this room, is you're not born again by the gospel of truth. You've not been converted. That's the first hindrance. If you haven't been born again, you cannot love the brethren in this way. You can't. Until you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never love the brethren. You can't because you're still spiritually dead. You need to be made alive. You're dead in sin. You must come to Christ in humility and turn away from sin and cling to Jesus Christ, who is gentle and lowly, and who will receive anyone who comes to him in faith, leaving their sins. The Bible says Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away your sins. But if you ignore him and live selfishly for your own glory and your own honor, Jesus will become the fierce lion. And he'll cast you into the lake of fire for all eternity. And it'll be your fault because he offered grace and salvation and you turned from it. The second hindrance to loving the brethren is being double-minded or half-hearted. Perhaps you know what I'm talking about. You have your secret darling idols in your life. You love them and you desire them and you want to keep them. And those idols keep you from loving the brethren sincerely and fervently 
with a pure heart. You're thinking you can have one foot in and one foot out, but you have misunderstood who Jesus really is and what he actually requires. He requires genuine repentance. He knows your heart and he wants all your heart. He is the prince who threw furniture down the temple steps and turned over the money changer tables. Jesus don't play with those who are duplicitous. It's better to be hot or cold, but the lukewarm he spits out. Another hindrance is pride. How can you love the brethren sincerely and fervently and with a pure heart when you're too busy judging them for wearing a mask or not wearing a mask? Loving your brethren is such a wonderful miracle. Many of the people in this local church, I said this already, never in a million years would have approached each other and selected one another for friends. But here you are, brothers in the same body of Christ. But God converted us and regenerated us and placed us in the same local church. This isn't theory when we talk about love the brethren. This is about our local church right here in Coconut Creek. It's about how we use our time and energy. We are living stones in the same building. We're body parts in the same body. Listen to this, this metaphor here. Have you ever noticed... And I, I got this, I forget where I got this, but I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying it the way I read it. But have you ever noticed when you get a quick darting pain in your back, quickly your hand comes to hold your back and you bend your legs and your eyes dart over. The whole body is engaged to help out that suffering part of your body. And that's what we're to be like. We're to support one another in our suffering, in our weakness. We're to love the brethren. And in many ways, I, I look at your faces and I'm preaching to the choir because I could, I could give a list of some of the most wonderful, just as wonderful as we heard from John Newton. I could, I could share with you people in this room and how they've loved the brethren in unbelievable, selfless ways. So I'm not chiding you. But I'm challenging you because the scripture wants us to superabound in these things. This is what we are to do here in this local church. We are to be devoted to one another in sincere love, fervent love, love from a pure heart. Some are hurting and they need love and kind words. Some are losing jobs and they might need money. Some are overwhelmed and they need a helping hand. May the Lord help us in this church to superabound in loving the brethren. Pride is also behind the sin of unforgiveness. God has freely forgiven you when you repent. Why do you hold grudges and fail to freely forgive your brother or sister? Pride. Maybe you have not thoroughly humbled yourself before Jesus Christ who has died for sinners and freely forgiven sinners, and yet your pride has made you slow to forgive. What shame and what sadness for you, the joy that you're missing, but also for the body of Christ. Free yourself from pride and repent and say, Father, forgive me for I'm a sinner. Please help me love the brethren. Well, we could go on and on, but let me mention one more hindrance to loving the brethren. And this is the last one. We'll close. Words. Hurtful words. Backbiting words. Talking behind someone's back. Running your mouth and then quickly saying, I was kidding. Well, listen to what the word of God says. Proverbs twenty six nineteen. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Proverbs 16, 28, an ungodly man digs up evil and it is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife and a whisperer separates the best of friends. God help us.
Proverbs 15, 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. In the last verse, Psalm 52, 2 through 5. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Well, obviously this doesn't apply to all of us. But it might apply to some of us. How do you use your words? Let's not end on a down note. If you're finding it impossible to love the brethren because you're not born again or converted and you haven't repented from your sins and believed in Christ, or maybe you're not loving the brethren because you're backsliding and struggling with remaining sin, or you still are struggling with selfish pride, or you have a mouth that is reckless, or you're double-minded, and you're holding on to those lovely idols, and you know you can't love God and simultaneously love your sin, and you're finding it's impossible because God wants your whole heart and you know it, well, there's very, very good news this morning. God is a God of mercy, and he loves when we humble ourselves and repent and turn away from our sin and trust him. Trust him to enable us to obey him and love him, which in turn will enable us to obey this command in First Peter, to love the brethren with sincerity, fervently, and with a pure heart. So I conclude by reading you two things. A hymn by Julia Johnson, and then I want to read to you our passage one more time. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. I think of the thief on the cross. A whole lifetime of wicked, wicked, sinful behavior. Even his sin wasn't exceeded. or It it can't exceed the love of Christ. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the lamb was spilt. There's a cost for the forgiveness of your sins. It's a very, very high cost. It's it's the life of Jesus Christ. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see his face. Will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Well, I close with just by reading our passage. Since you've been purified, excuse me, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass And all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we don't always understand the pain and the suffering that you bring into our lives. But we do see the cross and we see that our Savior had a life of suffering and that he freely gave up his life to suffer on the cross for us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the salvation provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we sojourn as pilgrims passing through this sinful world, we pray that you would enable us more and more to abound in loving your people, your chosen people that you've saved. Help us to love them with sincerity and with fervent fervency. Father, we pray that, that you would help us to prioritize our lives. You've done your part. Help us to do our part, we pray. May you get all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 